Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. As Amnon said, I took my uh, undergraduate degree at Tel Aviv University. Uh, one of my lecturers was uh, Amnon. Um, I remember that uh, while doing my undergraduate there, uh, I had, uh, just like every undergraduate student, I had uh, difficulties with quantum mechanics. Uh, one was, uh, Amnon was our um, instructor. And I remember him coming one of the lectures. And I try to figure out what this all means, and so on and so forth. And then one of the lecturers, uh, Mona Aroni, comes and says, you don't understand quantum mechanics. You just get used to it. And so from here on, it was smooth sailing physics, although I chose astrophysics afterwards. So thank you again for inviting me. I also want to thank um, uh, the American Physical Society and the Israeli Physical Society for sponsoring this, uh, this event. One of uh, humanity's everlasting and never-ending quests is to understand the origin and evolution of the universe. Here I'm showing the vision of Hindu mythology where the uh, earth is eternally suspended on three elephants. They're standing on top of a large turtle and the turtle is sitting on a large serpent in turn. Today we know that this is a rather crude uh, approximation of reality. <laughs> we have a, a modern a much well established observationally um, and different model of the evolution of the universe. Uh, according to this model, the universe begins at a hot and dense phase. Within the first fraction of a second, um, it, in, it uh, expands immensely through an inflationary period and then continues expanding at a slower, uh, at a slower rate. Quantum fluctuations during the epoch of inflation become matter density fluctuations that later collapse under the influence of gravity to form the structures of the universe that we see today, including the cluster of galaxies and everything else we see out there. One of the strong contributions to this model comes from measurements of the cosmic microwave background. So we're going to concentrate our attention on the universe. Oh, that's not, uh... sorry. So we're going to concentrate our attention on the universe as it is at about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. This is a time axis. This is a temperature axis. The temperature is just about hotter than 3,000 Kelvin. The universe is composed of electrons and protons. It's a hot plasma and much more numerous photons. The photons keep scattering from the electrons. And uh, every time a proton tries to combine with an electron to form hydrogen, um, the large number of high energy photons break it apart and the universe is a plasma, as I said. As the universe expands, it cools, the temperature and the temperature drops below 3000 Kelvin, the number of high energy photons su drops sufficiently that now electrons can form with protons, can combine with protons and form hydrogen. Whereas the scattering cross section between free electrons and photons is very large, the scattering cross-section between a photon and a hydrogen atom is, in, is orders of magnitude smaller. Effectively, the universe has become transparent to these photons. And since that time onward, they stream through the universe freely into our telescopes. This is called the, the cosmic microwave background. These photons are the cosmic microwave background radiation. Before this epoch, which is called the epoch of decoupling, the decoupling of radiation and matter, the universe is in thermal equilibrium. This is also called the surface of last scattering. What are the CMB observables? What cosmology do we learn from the CMB? Because matter and radiation are in thermal equilibrium, you expect the spectrum of the radiation to be that of a black body. And indeed, we observe a very nice black body. It is quantifiable in terms of a single parameter of the temperature, 2.725 Kelvin. The peak intensity is about 160 gigahertz, a wavelength similar to the microwave oven in the kitchen, about 2 millimeter. We also see that the universe, that the sky is extraordinarily uniform, 2.725 Kelvin within a small fraction of a degree. Um, at higher resolution and temperature, we do see fluctuations, but they too are quite uniform across the sky. It's about 200 microkelvin plus minus across the entire sky, but pretty uniform. You don't see one Kelvin here or minus three Kelvin there. 
just about 200 microkelvin plus minus across the entire sky. Our image of these fluctuations has sharpened with many experiments um, since COBE, uh, and including three satellites, including COBE. Um, here I'm focusing our attention on our own measurements in 2000. Um, at, the time, oh, at the time that we made these measurements, um, these were the highest resolution images over the largest pieces of the sky available at the time. Um, and Science Magazine called them one of the most important breakthroughs in science for 2000. Since then, of course, we had uh, the images from the WMAP satellite in 2003 at a resolution that's roughly the same as the Maxima experiment, but over the entire sky. And just last year, we have the measurements from the Planck satellite uh, at yet even higher resolution. What are these fluctuations? The cosmic microwave background is so rich in information because it is a boundary condition for everything that happened in the universe from the bang onwards until about 400,000 years. It is sensitive to the initial conditions to the quantum fluctuations at the epoch of inflation. It is sensitive to the matter con constituents in the universe, baryons, dark matter, dark energy, neutrinos, whatever you have in the universe. And it is sensitive to the interactions that had occurred between the initial conditions, all the matter constituents, to embed the fluctuations that we see in the cosmic microwave background today. But that's not only it. The cosmic microwave background is also an initial condition for the structure formation that occurred since the epoch of decoupling onwards. Here's an example for uh, the sensitivity to initial conditions. Why is the universe so uniform as we see it in the cosmic microwave background? Why is the temperature so uniform? Why are the fluctuations so uniform? The, uh, the only explanation we have at the moment for this uniformity is the paradigm of inflation. Here's how this goes. Imagine that there are three observers in the universe, we, Joe, and Jane, sometime after the Big Bang, shortly after the Big Bang, perhaps. And I've positioned those somewhere else in the universe far from us. At this time, after the Bang, Joe's causal horizon, and ours, and Jane's, is determined by the speed of light and the time since the bang. This is shown here as the purple circles. Of course, we are not communicating with Joe and Jane because our causal horizon is smaller than the distance between us. Sometime after the bang, maybe half a bi five billion years after the bang, the causal horizon grows. We're still not communicating with Joe and Jane. This is the universe today. Today, we're just photons from Joe and Jane are just arriving to us. But Joe and Jane never had any chance to communicate in any physical, physically meaningful fashion. How is it that when we look into Joe's direction or into Jane's, Jane's direction, we see exactly the same universe? The temperature is uniform, the same, temperature, the same intensity, and the fluctuations are roughly the same. Joe and Jane had never had a chance to communicate um, information and physics. The only explanation that we have for that is the paradigm of inflation. And here's, a, here's inflation in one slide. Imagine Joe at the beginning of the universe, and that's Joe's causal horizon, and he's having a nice cozy lunch with Jane. It's uh, nice and hot over there, because it's very close after the bang. Nevertheless, um, Joe shows Jane his meter stick that he uh, just bought at the market earlier that day. It's one of those tape measures that has tick marks on it. As soon as Jane holds the other side of the tape measure, the universe enters inflation. Within a small fraction of a second, it expands by an order of 10 to the 24 or so. And Joe now looks and says, Jane is not around, but his tape measure shows whatever the distance to Jane was times 10 to the 24 uh, larger. This uh, ruins the evening, but it does have the effect that for many billions of years afterwards, in fact, at least for 14 billion years afterwards, as Joe's horizon grows, the universe that the horizon encompasses has at some point in the past, shortly before inflation, been in causal contact. That's why the universe that we see has the same physics all around us. 
because at some point in the past, it was causally connected. But the initial conditions that inflation is not the only thing that's, uh, the uniformity is not the only thing that's explained by the cosmic microwave background, uh, by the fluctuations. In order to say more, we have to encode the fluctuations in quantum quantifiable manner. The way we quantify the fluctuations is by expanding them in spherical harmonic across the sky. Then we take the power coefficients of the spherical harmonics, square them and sum over the azimuthal number m, because there's no preferred direction in space. And we end up with a set of numbers that we call CL. This is the power as a function of the quantum number L, or as a function of the spherical harmonic number L. This is called the power spectrum. This tabulation is called the power spectrum. The power spectrum is so key in the discussion of cosmic microwave background because what we see on the sky is the result of random quantum fluctuations. So we cannot predict the exact spatial pattern, but we can predict the statistical properties of the C and B. The power spectrum is the contact point between theory and experiments. Experimentalists measure the pattern, convert it to a power spectrum. Theories tell us what the universe should like, again, on a statistical manner. Here I'm showing the power spectrum is measured recently by the Planck satellite. These are preliminary, um, preliminary results. They were probably published within a month or so. Uh, but what has been published last year looks exactly the same. Power is on the vertical axis. And the multiple L is on the horizontal axis. Small numbers are large, uh, large degrees on the sky, coarse resolution, large angular extent on the sky. Large Ls correspond to small angular correlations on the sky. So this is about 10 degrees and larger, or 0.1 degree or smaller. The blue points are the measurements of the Planck satellites. The red curve is a six parameter fit cosmology to the, blue, to the blue data points. The point on the bottom here uh, are the difference between the underlying cosmological model, which has only six parameters, and the, and the blue data points. Indeed, uh, we have quite a good agreement between our cosmological model and the measured data points. We can spend the rest of this discussion talking about the uh, many features that this power spectrum contains. Here, I'm just going to make a few remarks. What we see is we see a, 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 a series of peaks in the power spectrum. These, uh, these peaks in the temperature and isotropy power spectrum are a result of coherent acoustic oscillations in the early universe. Matter tries to collapse under, uh, uh, under the force of gravity around over densities. Photon pressure pushes it out. Matter collapses, photon pressure bounces it out. But you can only have this coherent set at specific angular scale if all the fluctuations of a given scale oscillate coherently at the same time. They have the same temporal phase. The only mechanism that can explain a coherency over horizon scale is the mechanism of inflation. We don't know of any other mechanism that would explain coherency over all fluctuations over the horizon scale at the epoch of decoupling. Um, we also, uh, the, the, the first peak location in L space, or in angular space, is a sensitive measure of the curvature of space. I'm not explaining exactly how, but it is a sensitive measure of the curvature of space. And we measure this curvature to be very nearly zero, or zero to very high precision. Again, this is consistent with the theory of inflation, in the sense that inflation took any curvature that had existed in space and made space flat to the degree that we see, uh, that we see in the cosmic background, background today. Because the fluctuations are, because they originate from quantum, quantum fluctuations in the early universe, the, the fluctuation spectrum is sensitive to the spatial power spectrum of the primordial quantum energy density fluctuations. That, the, that primordial uh, spectrum is also quantifiable in terms of a spatial power spectrum. It is, it is generically parameterized in terms of a power coefficient. 
and some k, um, uh, k dependence with a spectral index n. Inflation predicts that, that spectral index n would be close to 1, so that there is no preferred scale. Close to 1 minus 1 is 0, so inflation predicts that the power spectrum, the primordial power spectrum, would be 0. But not exactly 0. It would not be exactly absent of scale. Inflation predicts that it would be 1, close to 1, but not exactly 1. Again, what I'm showing here is a measurement uh, from the Planck satellite. Now, Planck was not the first one. WMAP, WMAP was the first one. But now showing that the spectral index here is 0.965, very close to 1, but at very high precision, different than 1. Um, that the power spectral index n here is close to 1, but not exactly 1, is considered one of the triumphs of inflationary theories. And finally, the other comment I'd like to make is about the relative amplitudes of these acoustic peaks in the power spectrum. The relative amplitude of the acoustic peaks is sensitive to the matter constituents in the universe. If there are more baryons, the second peak would go up, the first peak would go down. If there's uh, less dark energy, the relative amplitude would change. So the pie chart that I'm showing here, telling us that there are 5% baryon, 27% dark matter, and 68% dark energy, this comes solely from the cosmic microwave background. Of course, we have strong confirmation to this from other astrophysical measurements, but I'm showing this only from the cosmic microwave background. Um, not all information came from Planck or from the satellite. Uh, I can't, in this talk, really do justice to all the other experiments. I'll just take one other example. I'm showing here the temperature power spectrum measured by Planck. This is from the data in 2013, light blue. Uh, it goes all the way to about L2500. Uh, Notice that the L scale is now extends all the way to 10,000. The earlier spectra that I showed truncated to 25,000. In red here, I'm showing data points from the South Pole Telescope, a telescope at the South Pole, 10 meter telescope with a resolution of about one arc minute in three frequency band, 150 gigahertz in red, uh, green is 220 gigahertz, and uh, blue is 95 gigahertz. We see several things. First of all, we see that now these days we have measurements of the power spectrum all the way to 10,000. Up to about 2,500, the spectrum is dominated by the CMB, and there's very nice agreement between the data points and the cosmological model. This is the same generic six-parameter model that I've showed earlier. There's a very nice agreement between uh, the SPT point and the Planck point. All experiments essentially now agree on the measurements of this power spectrum. At high angular scales, we see the effects of messy astrophysics. This is not cosmology anymore. We see the rise here. This is due to uh, galaxies, point sources, galaxies that still have emission in CMB frequencies. And we see the effects of CMB photons scattering from clusters of galaxies because of the hot gas in them. I'm showing you the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. This is another telescope in Chile this time that measured similar uh, spectra all, all the way to high L. There's a third observable for the cosmic microwave background, the polarization. The scattering of the cosmic microwave background at the surface of last scattering is determined by the Thomson cross-section. The Thomson cross-section depends on the polarization of incident and outgoing photons. But you would expect that since it is a black body, that there would be net zero polarization. However, each one of the photons that we observe in our telescope had one last scatter before it was scattered in our direction. That last scatter embeds a net observable polarization in the cosmic microwave background. It is useful to understand what are the specific physical mechanisms that give rise to this, anisotro to this polarization. Let's focus our attention on an electron at the last scattering surface. If the radiation environment around this electron is uniform, there would be no net polarization in the observed direction, here taken to be sort of in 90 degrees to this, to this pattern. So the observers are here. 
and uh, this is some radiation field around the electron. And of course, we're talking about that last scatter. However, if there's a quadrupole temperature and isotropy around this electron, let's say it's hot here and here and cold here and there, more intensity here, more intensity there, less intensity here, less intensity there, then you can see that a net polarization would arise along the cold direction. More intensity, more intensity, less and less, a net polarization that is aligned along the cold direction. Other multipoles, you could see by symmetry that other multipoles would not contribute an isotropy. For example, a dipole and isotropy, let's say hot and cold, that would cancel out and there would be zero net polarization. The same goes for the other multipoles. There would be zero net polarization. Only a quadrupolar isotropy at the last scattering surface gives net polarization. Now you can argue that the radiation field at the last scattering surface should have all multipoles. So it's not surprising that we should have also a quadrupole and therefore a net polarization. But it's useful to see what exactly are the physical mechanisms that give this quadrupole and isotropy. There are two physical mechanisms that give quadrupole and isotropy at the last scattering surface. One of them is due to plasma flows. Let's focus our attention on an overdensity back at the time of the plasma or at the last scattering surface. Due to this overdensity, matter flows in, pulling the radiation with it. Matter and radiation are, are in thermal equilibrium. And the velocities are increasing as a function of radius away from the overdensity. Here is how this looks from the viewpoint of an electron at the rest from an electron right there. Viewed from the rest from an electron, it sees hot in this direction and cold tangentially, hot radially and cold tangentially. This is a quadrupole pattern. This quadrupole pattern, remember, makes polarization parallel to the cold direction. So in this position, it gives a tangential, um, tangential polarization, tangential to the overdensity. If you do the same thing in other location, you can see that we, we get a tangential pattern around over densities. In similar way, uh, we get a radial pattern around under densities. Again, in the rest frame, you see cold here, hot there, and the polarization is aligned with the cold direction. The net effect is that bulk flows that come from Density perturbations, bulk flows at the surface or just before the surface of last scatter, give what's called an E polarization. We call this an E polarization pattern. It has the symmetries of the E field, although it has nothing to do with an electromagnetic E field, just has the same symmetries. It's a curl free that is either radial or tangential. This is one physical mechanism. Another physical mechanism comes from the traversal of gravity waves through the plasma. Here I show a gravity wave that traverses the plasma in one polarization. It stretches and compresses space along two directions. Of course, there's going to be the other polarization rotated around this axis by 45 degrees. It also has this quadrupole polarization pattern. And what it does, it produces both E polarization just like before, it has the tangential and radial. But more importantly, gravity waves also produce what we call a B polarization pattern, this curliness. Um, So gravity waves produce both E and B. Um, There are two sources of gravity waves influences on the cosmic microwave background. The first one comes from inflation. Inflation generates a background of gravity waves back at the early universe at 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the bang. These gravity waves that are generated right here, it's hard to see, I guess, from the back perhaps, but gravity waves are generated here and they propagate through space and they stretch and compress the plasma just before decoupling, embedding both E, but more importantly, a B mode pattern on the polarization pattern. Only inflation produces a B pattern. 
energy density uh, are scalar perturbations. They don't produce a B pattern. They produce only E. So if we measure a B pattern on the cosmic microwave background, we had seen the signatures of inflation. The amplitude of the B mode that we observe at the cosmic microwave background is proportional or is equal to something that's called the tensor to scalar ratio. That's the ratio of how much gravity waves there are to scalar perturbations. So I have to talk about R because everything else is in astrophysics or in CMB is encoded in terms of R. What's important is that the value of R determined from B is proportional to the energy scale of inflation. So if we can go and measure the B on the last scattering surface from inflation, we can determine the energy scale of inflation. Furthermore, an observation of the B mode at the last scattering surface is a direct probe of quantum gravity. This is gravity acting at the quantum scale. There's another source for B mode. It is not primordial. It happens after decoupling. Photons, after the surface of last scattering, travel through the rest of the universe while they come to our telescopes. As they travel through the universe, they get lensed, they get deflected by clusters of galaxies, by the logical structure of the universe, and that deflection takes some of the E pattern and makes it a B. Here is a compilation of temperature, E mode, and B mode measurements as of today. This is the temperature power spectrum, now measured with Planck and some of the, um, the um, small-scale experiments, all the way to about 5,000. Here is the E, here's the power spectrum, the spatial power spectrum of the E, of the E mode. We call them E because it's a cross-correlation, E, E, or T, T. So that's why we call them TT, E, E, and BB. The E power spectrum comes, as, as I said, comes from the density perturbations. So it is, comes from the same source that the temperature fluctuations come from. There are no free parameters, so to speak, in the E, in the E power spectrum. If you know the T temperature power spectrum, you can predict what the E should be. Lo and behold, our measurements of the E conform exactly to the same model that the temperature comes from. This black curves are exactly the same cosmology. Someone has coined several years ago the term of precision cosmology. This is indeed precision cosmology. Down here, I'm showing recent measurements as of the last year from B mode measurements. Here, this dash dot green line are measurements of the lensing power spectrum. This is the deflection of the photon, not primordial, through the logical structure of the universe after the last scattering surface. I'm showing measurements of the polar bear experiments in light blue and the SPT pole in, in, in red and some upper limits from the ACT pole experiment. Uh, again, the level here is not subject to much uncertainty. We know what the universe is made of. We can calculate how the universe, how the photons are lensed. And again, we are finding the measurements agree with the predictions. Here at the large, at the coarse resolution, low L, I'm showing in green or Lyman Page is showing, showing in green theoretical models for the primordial B mode that's coming from inflation for various values of the tensor to scalar ratio of 0.1. This is R of 0.2, this is R of 0.1, and as R decreases, the tensor to scalar ratio decreases, this spectra go down. Right here, you see a set of black points. These are measurements from the BICEP, BICEP experiment as of several months ago. And we will get back to these measurements um, very soon. In the meantime, I'd like to take a different direction and tell you a little bit about uh, how we make these measurements. And I randomly chose my own experiment to tell you about. Um, the experiment is called EBEX, E and B experiment. It is a collaboration of a number of institutions. The lead institution is the University of Minnesota. Most funding comes from NASA. Uh, uh, we also have a collaboration with uh, the Weizmann Institute, and Ilan Sagib, who is here, up there, uh, was a graduate student with Weizmann at, and at Minnesota and made important contribution to, um, to EBEX. The goal of EBEX was to detect or set an upper bound for the inflationary B mode. Here, is, here are the theories, again, 
L versus e, power versus L. This is the E power spectrum, the B from lensing, and the B from inflation, and this is the combination. And so the goal was to detect or set an upper bound on the uh, B mode from inflation, um, to also detect the lensing signal right here, and we had a third goal, which is to measure the effects of galactic dust. Here I'm showing the expected B spectrum from galactic dust, so that's um, uh, galactic in our own galaxy emits in our wavelength, and this is the B mode power spectrum. <coughs> sorry. Oh. oh, sorry. Okay. And this is the B mode power spectrum that we expect at 150 gigahertz, 250, and 410. And so we were trying to probe with these three frequencies the effects of galactic dust. Um, what are the design principles? We implement uh, more than 1,000 uh, detectors on a balloon-borne uh, payload. Uh, we fly for 11 days. This all comes to increase the sensitivity of the experiment. We try to control foreground by only dealing with a dust foreground. There is another foreground in the, coming from the galaxy that comes from synchrotron radiation in the galaxy. Free electrons flying in the magnetic field in the galaxy produce synchrotron radiation. Uh, but at 150 gigahertz, our lowest frequency, the contamination is expected to be very low. So we want it to be dominated only by dust. If we went to lower frequencies, the contribution of synchrotron increases. That's, we, and we didn't want to get confused. Um, and we fly on a balloon in order to get uh, information at the high frequencies at above, above about 250 gigahertz, you can't make measurements from the ground. So we go on a balloon to make the measurements at these frequencies. And then we use, uh, for uh, systematic errors, we use a continuously rotating half-wave plate, which gives good rejection of systematic errors. This is a topic that I will not discuss much in this talk. Uh, here's the instrument. Here it is uh, uh, before launch. Uh, this is about eight meters. Here you see uh, sun shields. These are sun shades. Uh, this one is a ground shade. Uh, it is uh, 2.7 ton, and uh, we have the power system of about 2.6 kilowatts. I'm told that this is the largest and heaviest payload that has ever been launched in Antarctica. When you take these shields uh, away, uh, this is the, you can see the structure. This is where the balloon uh, is connected to. Uh, you'll see that a little bit later. There's a rotator that, that controls the position of the telescope in azimuth. Um, then we have this structure that is called the inner frame. It is connected by a, a trunnion pin here, here to a, the, another structure that is we call the outer frame. This entire structure can pivot about this axis in elevation. So altogether, we have both elevation and azimuth control. We have two direction control um, uh, while we scan. Uh, we take some, you take some more of the shields away, and now you see the primary mirror. Light comes from the sky, bounces from the primary into the secondary, and from the secondary into the receiver that, that sits here. That's this blue container. Um, if you take that receiver, we split it up to two. Light comes from the, uh, from the secondary mirror, goes into the receiver, uh, into the cryostat. There are several lenses. There's a uh, polarizing grid, and if it's reflected, into this focal plane or transmitted into that other focal plane. This is all uh, under cryogenic temperatures, and the focal plane are cooled to about 250 millikelvin above uh, 250 millikelvin. You also see star cameras that are used for instantaneous pointing. Um, here is the photograph of the uh, of the uh, instrument. This is just the in, uh, insides of the receiver. Uh, this is a photograph, light comes from the sky. This is the polarizing, uh, polarizing grid, uh, <coughs> lenses, and one focal plane is here, the other focal plane is down here. This is all maintained at one Kelvin with one uh, adsorption refrigerator. And as I said, the focal planes are maintained uh, at 270 or 250 millikelvin uh, with uh, this adsorption refrigerator, we call it the helium-10, because it is uh, two helium-4 fridges uh, helium-4 with two helium-3 fridges uh, back. Um, 
before, uh, now I would like to concentrate on the focal plane and shows you how the focal planes look like, but before I do that, I want to highlight that when Kobe flew uh, in 1989, it had only two detectors. When we flew Maxima, uh, several years later, we had four detectors. WMAP in 2000 had 20 detectors, and Planck, that is now producing results, had 72 detectors. Um, only 54 of them are polarization sensitive. This is one of two focal planes that we have on EBEX. What you see here are seven silicon wafers. Each black dot is an independent polarimeter, is an independent detector. Um, we have four uh, wafers, four silicon wafers that are tuned to 150 gigahertz, two at 250 gigahertz and one at 410. And as I said, we have two such focal planes. This is about 30 centimeter in, 30 centimeter in diameter. When you zoom on one of those wafers, this is what you see. Now each white dot is, uh, is an independent detector. And you can see these streets, these are the wires leading from wire bonds into each one of those detectors. A further zoom is a zoom on a single detector, which you see here is a spider web. The white, you can imagine, is just empty space. It's not really, but you can imagine that it's empty space. The CMB photon is about that long. It comes, the spider web is metallized by metal, by gold, and the CMB photon comes and essentially she just sees a sheet of metal and it gets absorbed. Um, if you zoom in the middle, you see a transition head sensor. This is essentially a heat detector. The CMB photons absorbed, warm up the entire web, and we measure the either higher or lower temperature with a transition head sensor that is operating on the transition edge of, um, of a superconductor. This is an aluminum titanium proximity sandwich. It's a TC of about 450 millikelvin. We measure changes in resistance of about 50 microhm. By measuring the change in current, we voltage bias and we measure slight changes in current of about 10 picoamps with squid amplifiers and we multiplex about 16 such detectors into a, a pair of wires. In total, we have about uh, more than 1,000 detectors in the focal plane. Here's the focal plane when it's all constructed. Here are six of the seven wafers. The seven wafers does go in the middle, just not photographed here. And this is all constructed together uh, with filters and everything just before, just before flight. Um, when you run a program like this, you run into sort of all sorts of odd situations. This is from our test flight in 2009. We launched in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, and the payload flies all the way west to, uh, to the border with California. And sort of when the sun sets, you see a big uh, light bulb in the sky because the sun illuminates the balloon. And of course, immediately, there's a bright, unidentified foreign object over Phoenix, Arizona on the 11th of June. Did you see the huge bright UFO over Phoenix, Arizona? This is www.realufo.net. <laughs> um, I don't know if you could see from back there, but this is even a picture. And the, there's a white dot right there. That's our balloon. That's a photograph from 80 miles away from Phoenix, Arizona. And then uh, we ran into another odd situation where we sent our payload to Antarctica. Uh, the truck got stolen en route to Antarctica. Uh, and here we are features in one of the uh, local NBC stations, Space Balloon Telescope goes missing near Dallas, Texas. Uh, luckily, a few days later, expensive NASA equipment found in North Texas. Apparently, the uh, people who stole the truck, they opened the back. They saw all sorts of, uh, they didn't see TVs, they didn't see cigarettes. They saw vacuum pumps and other things they couldn't understand. So they took a ladder and a fan and a bike and left us alone. <laughs> So in the end of all of this, um, uh, in the end of all of this, uh, we are in Antarctica, and um, and uh, this is the this is the launch of the experiment. Here is the bubble, and uh, I'll pause this momentarily. Okay. So what you see here is the bubble. The bubble is held here with a, with a collar. The balloon extends all the way to here. Uh, the balloon extends all the way to here. From here, there's a parachute. 
that is connected to the payload, this is the payload on the launch vehicle. This is Mount Erebus, it's an active volcano. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's bubbling fume all the time, it's a beautiful sight. It's one of those uh, active volcanoes that has lava all the time coming out. It's not bursting, it's just bubbling all the time. Uh, this is a, uh, a dead volcano, Mount Terror, and right behind Mount Terror, on the other side of the mountains, is uh, one of the largest emperor, ping em emperor penguin hatcheries. Um, so if any one of you have read books about um, uh, visiting those or have seen the penguin movies, it's right behind these mountains. At any rate, um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to align the flight line uh, straight up with the payload and then release. So you'll see how this, uh, how this happens. There are, uh, there are four people here um, holding the payload and they're trying to, they're waiting and the, pay, the uh, launch vehicle will maneuver to make sure that the payload is exact, that the balloon is exactly aligned with the payload. And then they release the collar and you'll see the, uh, and you'll see the, uh, the collar falling down, that's, that's normal. So these are, uh, this is one piece of the collar and then you see another piece falling down here. Okay, and that's, uh, that's the release. That was indeed a very smooth launch. Uh, and it takes about two and a half hours to go to a 35 kilometers, 120,000 feet. Um, um, and so uh, we flew the payload in 2012, December 2012. Uh, we launched in McMurdo at the edge of the Antarctic continent. Uh, this is the entire trajectory, 25 days. This is highly unusual to actually have 25 days. The average time for one circumnavigation is about 10, 11 days. We have designed the payload to have liquid helium for only one circumnavigation, and so the helium ran out right about there, and then we waited for some more time and uh, terminated the, uh, the flight uh, back here. Uh, during this flight, we scan about 6,000 square degrees of the sky. This is now in galactic coordinate. This is the galactic plane. Uh, this was about 15 times larger than we actually designed. We had designed the experiment to scan about 400 square degrees and, and concentrate the sensitivity on about 1% of the sky. Um, uh, a NASA engineer had made a mistake in the thermal design of one of our components and uh, we didn't have azimuth control and so we let the payload spin around and, uh, and we observed a, about 6,000 square degrees of the sky. Other than that, everything worked well. Uh, we do see, uh, this is, uh, signals, every time we cross the galaxy, we see signals. This, these are only from 15 out of the uh, three or 400 or so that we have at 250 gigahertz. 15, uh, 15 bolometers, several passes on the galactic plane, on this side of the galactic plane. And when you pass the other side, uh, you see RCW38. It's nearly a point source. So we do see galactic sources. Um, here, uh, we see some preliminary analysis of the data. Uh, this is a depth map, the sensitivity at 150 gigahertz. We have about uh, one to two microkelvin or a degree squared on big pieces of the sky, and the scale goes to about 20 microkelvin on one degree. And these are preliminary, preliminary polarization map at Q, and of course we have U and we have uh, temperature as well. Uh, so these are all the results, uh, the, the preliminary results, these are not results, just the state of the analysis. As we're working on the data, and as I think many of you know, in March 2014, just about uh, several months ago, uh, another collaboration, the BICEP collaboration, had announced 
Space Ripples, this is the New York Times. Space Ripples revere Big Bang smoking gun. Uh, even here in our own newspapers, Haaretz, um, pretty reserved. Astronomers discover ripples in the fabric of space time. But Ynet is not reserved at all. Ynet is Agavia Hakadoshe Lamada. And not of physics, Shel Hamada, Kolamada. And if you look here, you probably can't see that, but there is an astronomer uh, quoted, Noten Hezbel La Sheilot Lama Anu Kayamim. Okay. So, um, at any rate, BICEP, BICEP 2 is an experiment at the South Pole. This is the experiment here, it's hard to see. Uh, this is the experiment itself, this is a ground shield, this is the sun setting at the South Pole. Uh, they have three years of data. They have observed in only, or they published three years of data. They have observed only at a single frequency, 150 gigahertz. They made deep observations like the ones that we uh, plan to do over about 1% of the sky uh, in a small patch at high galactic latitudes uh, and achieved a sensitivity of about, uh, about 10 times better than us, 90 nanokelvin per degree squared. Um, here is this uh, power spectrum that I showed earlier, temperature EE lensing, and here are the bicep points. Uh, now, this is a zoom on the bicep points as reported by the bicep 2 collaboration. So what you can see there, the, day, the, the black points are the bicep 2 points, and you can see a clear detection, a clear high significance detection above zero. These blue points are null, are null tests, uh, jackknife tests. Uh, so it's a clear detection of B modes at, um, uh, at coarse vision at, at low Ls. And their interpretation was that this is a B mode from inflation at a tensor to scalar ratio of R of 0.2. Alas, oh, and, uh, and this is, and you can see here uh, these curly features um, in the temperature anisotropy. So, so it's temperature and isotropy in the background, and the bars are the polarization patterns, and you can see the, these curly features. Um, since then, the field has evolved. Uh, soon after, there were questions about the validity of the BICEP2 interpretation. Less so on the detection of the B modes, but more so on the interpretation of the results as coming from inflation. Um, Planck has shown results from measurements at 353 gigahertz. Now, mind you, at 353 gigahertz, the CMB is subdominant to the emission from our own galaxy. So at 353 gigahertz, what you measure in polarization is the polarization of our own galactic dust. <coughs> so Planck has measured the polarization of galactic dust at 353 gigahertz. Using this measurement and some of their own data, they predict what the level should be at 150 gigahertz. That's the bicep frequency and um, one of our own. Um, but they do this prediction for the bicep 2 region, exactly the same region as as, ob as observed by BICEP. The first conclusion that Planck has is that galactic dust overall, over the entire sky, and that's shown here, galactic dust is much higher, the polarization of galactic dust is higher than initially thought. Planck measures about 10 to 18 percent fractional polarization of galactic dust. Um, People have, did think that galactic dust could be 10 or 15% polarized, or maybe 10, uh, but 18% is quite high. Here, the level of galactic dust near the south galactic pole is predicted on this color diagram in units normalized to how much CMB there is at R equals 2, or how much inflation signal there is at R.2. This is the bicep 2 region. Blue is less dust and red is more dust. You can see that the bicep 2 region is in a mid dust region. There are regions of higher dust, but there are also certainly regions of lower dust. The bottom line is that uh, using this prediction to 150 gigahertz, what you see here in these bands is the prediction for Planck for how much dust there is in the bicep 2 region in, uh, as a function of L. 
And you could see that at the lowest L, the results from Planck from dust is entirely consistent with the measurement of bicep 2. So the conclusions for now is that the bicep 2 measurement of R.2 is entirely consistent with galactic signal, not from coming from inflation. Primordial signal at this level, not, not at this level, but it is L, is still possible, but not at the level predicted by, uh, by bicep 2. I had 95% confidence is less, the, less than 0.09. So bicep 2 may still have seen B mode from inflation, but not at the level that they claim. Um, what is there? Yep. Okay. What is there for us in the next decade? Uh, just in about a few weeks from now, Planck will release its C and B polarization results, end of January. It was expected to be uh, the end of uh, November, then the end of December, now it's the end of January, uh, including a joint analysis uh, on the bicep 2 region. Within the next one to five years, there's going to be much more B mode information coming from a whole host of experiments SPT, ACT, uh, uh, Keck Array, Simons Array, this shows the Simons Array 20,000 transition head sensors, SPT 3G, the third generation of the South Pole Telescope, 15,000 detectors. Our own our next experiment shown here with predicted data points all the way down here. So there's going to be much more information. Uh, furthermore, in the future, um, in a, a collaboration of all major US groups have now coalesced things uh, around what we call CMB stage four experiment. This is predicted to have 250,000 detectors or multiple apertures, perhaps over the planet. Um, and here we show the level predicted of 0.001 as an error on the tensor to scalar ratio on R. And this is for various configuration of the experiment. All of them are better than our predicted level of 0.001. This is our target goal for the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, this shows constraint in the neutrino mass. Uh, because of time, I will skip that. I can get back to that. Uh, what about a fourth generation satellite? Uh, there is an ESA uh, deadline for submission of proposals in a, just about two or three weeks from now. Uh, we're going to propose together with ESA, uh, together with European collaborators, uh, Core Plus. And, uh, and JAXA has this predicted um, has a, a proposal um, for a light bird. And what I'm showing here is the light bird sensitivity way down at, again at 0 0.001. So to summarize. The cosmic microwave background has already provided a treasure trove of cosmological information. B-mode polarization will tell us about the physics of the Big Bang and about quantum gravity. Measurements will certainly be limited by foregrounds and potentially by the B-mode lensing signal. Uh, this is shown here. This is shown here. This is the lensing signal. And if you have that sensitivity, any measurements of R at this level is limited by lensing down here. B-mode lensing will give us constraint on the sum of the neutrino masses, and you should certainly expect more in the coming decade. Thank you very much.